Hello everyone, uh, my name is Marco Trombetti and I'm an entrepreneur and investor. So I started as an entrepreneur in 1999, building Translated, uh, one of the first internet translation company. Then I founded another company called Memopal, and with the profits from these two ventures, I started a venture fund called Pi Campus, which have done about 48 investments. And of those uh, two, uh, historically passed the evaluation of $1 billion, uh, so the so-called unicorns. So today um, I can um, share with you one other piece of um, how to build great companies and it's about how to make products. So to try to understand where we are in the process, um, to build something great you need to generate an initial idea, you need to build a product, validate the product, then grow the company. And so this process that we're talking today is not about generating the initial idea. For these things, I strongly suggest you to read an essay for, from Paul Graham, uh, How to Get Startup Ideas. You will find brilliant ways to, to, to generate ideas and a lot of inspiration. So what we are talking here is the step immediately after. Once you have a great idea and a hypothesis, how to try to build a product in the fastest amount of time with quality so that you can prove your hypothesis and you can decide uh, if to raise money with the product and grow it and become this your, your next adventure for, for many years. So uh, the reason why we want to do this is that because uh, this phase is not, is not evident, it's often very counterintuitive. And because we have many uh, different uh, elements that, that conflict and our interest in creation, we want to, to build things that makes us happy. And then we have the fear of discovering that what we're building is not interesting for people. And so the process I designed here uh, today, which is a very simple process of a few points, is exactly designed to try to counterbalance these two things. So um, you're willing to create something that gives you a lot of energy and we want to empower that. Also with the fact of forcing people to go and validate their ideas before it's too late. Uh, the most successful products I've seen, uh, again, are not because the initial idea was the super best idea in the world but because the founders were able to do cycles very quickly to make converge that idea into something that, that people love. So when you build something, um, also outside I've seen, no, you need creativity and you need also discipline. And most of the other methodologies that I've seen out uh, tend to empower one of these two elements. Uh, and in most of the cases, uh, the process are built so that creativity and discipline, they fight each other rather than supporting each other. So with the methodology I want to propose today, I'm trying to build something that will help creativity and discipline actually working together to try to deliver a great product. In fact, if you, if you, when building a product, if you're driven just by discipline and you, you will have managers running a product you will end up with something very boring that probably solve a problem, but the magic is not there. And it would, we kind of solve the problem to the user, but will not make something that is really uh, appreciated by, by some users. And that is the way to start. And uh, if you are driven just by creativity and you forget discipline in the process, and there are many, many methods also about that, you will you will end up uh, by do building something fun, interesting, that people are attracted with, but you will fail delivering the quality that is required for the product to become a great product. So you really need the two. You need creativity and discipline, and we need to, that these two will co cooperate. So um, the best, best way uh, to do these things, to build a product, is something quite rare, uh, where you have a founder that have the problem, 
So the founder is trying to solve a problem that he has, she has, or a group of founders that they have a problem. And uh, the person, the founder, or the founders are also able to build the solution and are also able to validate the solution. That's the ideal case. The ideal, ideal case is just that it's just one single person where in his mind all these three things are happening. As I, again, because it's not about the initial idea, because it's about the way you converge uh, to, to, to something people love, having one person, this is all happening in the mind, in the head of a single person. That is the fastest way to do it. So unfortunately, this is quite uncommon. It's very rare that you find these three elements. More, more, in more general way, you will have a group of founders and one perceives the problem, another one is able to solve it, it's a developer maybe, building the solution, and someone else is, is helping mitigate the, the contrast you know, between, between uh, these two. So, so even if the ideal case, as I said, is that ideas are validated in the mind of a single person that is able to do everything and converge to a point where you know you have something interesting and then you you aggregate a bigger team. Uh, in most, most of the cases, you have multiple founders in a company. And, uh, and so I, I designed this process for this case. There is also many positive elements of having multiple founders, especially in, in the phases just immediately after uh, building the product. And so I always encourage not to be a single founder, but to be multiple founders. But in this specific case, iteration is important. So really, we need to create a method so that the founders will interact quickly as it is one single person. And so uh, I, my experience in, in, in with this method comes from build, having built multiple products at, at Translated for the last 20 years in the language space, and then Memopal in cloud storage. But most importantly, by the tens and tens of startups, successful startups that I've seen, that inspired me uh, in, uh, in understanding what is behind a great products. And obviously, uh, I think that big part of what I'm sharing with you today comes from the big mistakes that I've done and I've seen doing. And they always uh, are a big part of the, of the learning. So um, if you think, so let's start by, by setting up what are the minimum people that you need, the minimum skills that you need for starting this process. So you have the idea, now we have to build it in the fastest amount of time with quality for validating that people love what we're building. So the typical team uh, will be composed by a product manager, by users, and by a developer. And so a product manager can act as a coordinator, okay? So if you have multiple founders, so the, the CEO will probably be the product manager. Then you have the, the users, and I'm mentioning users why because in the, in the best, best case, you as a founder, you're also the user of the product. And that is an ideal case because you deeply understand what you're trying to solve. But since this is not possible in all the cases, uh, you want to make sure that the users are on board. Most of the other methods I've seen completely ignore users. Uh, but I think the user needs to be in the room at day one, either in the mind of the founder or in the room. The way you pick users is another complex stuff, but they need to be early adopters. You know, people that are willing to, to invest money to obtain the future just you know, a few days, a few months before the others. There should be people that are willing uh, to experiment for sure. Uh, very often that they're willing to spend money for solving the problem, we say premium users that are able to pay, pay a premium for a premium service. So the product manager, the developer, and the users. You, you can have multiple users. The important is that you pick those 
that are really relevant and again premium early adopters. So in the first phase you can set up a certain number of meetings, short meetings, one, two hours, where you go down and dig down the pains. I think we discussed it also in the pitch. So identifying the perceived pains the user have is the most important thing to start. You don't want to have these meetings to be too long because otherwise uh, you will start having the initial ideas diluted, the, in the initial pains diluted by many other pains. So you want to focus, you want this meeting to be long enough so that the problem appears, the real problem appears, but not too long so that they, they get diluted with many other problems that are actually secondary and tertiary uh, problems. So find the length and, and, and for finding this length the role of the product manager uh, is important. He needs to decide when we're done. When you have one, two, three maximum highly perceived pains that you want to move forward. Ideally one is sufficient and is the best case but obviously uh, sometimes by iterating and testing two or three hypotheses in the same times can also give you speed. So that's again is about your perception. If you feel you have a very strong hypothesis where all the users agree, you can go with one. If you feel there is some discussion, go with a few. Uh, going with ten probably is a, it's just a waste of time. So once you've done that, um, the, and also to make sure that the, the perceived pain is exposed, uh, the product manager will look like a jerk. And um, the users will, will often very try to please you by saying that the, your initial idea is a problem that they have. And uh, in the reality, you should never, never listen to what user says. You should only listen and look to what people do. So when I say being a jerk, because you have to dig down, down the problem until the user kind of hates you because how intimate you are going deep into the problem. Um, very often also, you. As I said, you cannot rely on what people say uh, and you have to look at what they do. And the best way I've found to, uh, to do this is that you ask the user not if they like something or if this is a problem that they have, but if they're willing to buy it. But obviously you, you don't have it. So what you do is you simulate. So having the discussion, you realize there is something important coming out and you pretend a similar product already exists. So you say, oh, but this already exists. You don't need, you need to build it. There is this product that does this and costs this. Would you like to get me one for you? So with this simple question, by simulating the existence of the product on parallel, you remove the bias that there is in the group of pleasing you and also you are forcing the user to tell if that is really the perceived problem they're willing to spend money on. So in this first phase, at the end, end up pretending that the product exists, try to tell them, okay, I can buy you one, do you want it? If they say, yes, you're done, go to the next step, it's a beautiful situation. If they say no, you have to go back and try to uh, reiterate on the problem. If you dig down too much and you pass the point of being a jerk, looking like a jerk, well, okay, you need to change the users and uh, you, you, you will have you know, a conflict with those users, you cannot move on. Don't worry, at the end, at the end they, if you tell them the story afterwards, they will understand what we're trying to achieve, they will not feel bad. So once we're done with this, Great products, okay, solve problems, okay? But they only, they don't only uh, solve problems. I mean, the truly successful problem start by solving something, but they end a few more things on top of it. 
And one thing is about the vision. Um, I always um, suggest to start from pains. You cannot create a, a successful product by having a vision and not solving a problem. But you can create a successful product even by having solving something and not having vision. But the two will create great products. Pain and vision. So start with pain first. Make sure that the pain is, is well set up before adding any vision on top of it. So for vision, um, is another trick. Here, you're trying to express the potential of what could be done in the future. Um, this is another simulation where the developers very often uh, will be feared of discussing um, a possible future um, because they will feel that you will ask them to build something that they don't know how to build yet. And so that kind of fear, you want to remove the fear from them. So what you do is that you pretend now you are discussing a future that you will never build. So you can ask developers saying, look, consider that this is the pain. What will the technology in 10 years be able to do for this pain? What could be possible in 10 years' time? And so you start simulating with them and discussing this great future. You get them excited about what is possible. And by doing that, you discover the great path for this product. But the most important thing is that you bring them, the developers, to start thinking that they love the future that they designed it. And at one point, this may help them getting the courage to try to go for that future. So vision is about to getting the developers out of their fears, designing a great future. And, and, and now you have, for the user, not only solving a problem, but also telling them a vision behind this product, where by starting buying this product and, and writing this story with you, they will end up in a better place just by being with you. So once you've done that, the third uh, point, the third kind of meetings you want to do, so there was a few meetings for, for the pains, a few meetings for the vision, and then you want to start in discussing pathos, emotions. Um, so today, I mean, we, we live in a world that has got still a lot of problems for many, many people. But the, the majority of the buyers of your product, they have all their basic needs already solved. So emotions are playing an increasing role in great products. And you cannot underestimate that. And you have to make sure you, the design of the emotions is part of the product, even in the early phase. So to give examples of a very successful thing, uh, um, Instagram, for example, uh, was based on an emotional element, psychological element, that is uh, vanity. So the initial idea for Instagram was that I, it was providing you with filters, uh, with a squared image format. And those filters were making your picture pictures look different and better from your friends. So in the Maslow pyramid, you know, vanity, so appearing good compared to your peers is one of the key elements for people to, uh, to, feel, to feel good. And, and so many great products today target vanity and laziness. And when I say laziness, many people think about the, the the negative connotation of laziness, but I'm really thinking about the positive one. So laziness is about saving time. So if you can do something with time, uh, with one minute, or you can do it in two minutes, nobody ever will choose the two minutes option. You will always go for the shortest path. And because behind laziness, there is the most important, valu the most important valuable, valuable thing we have, time. So time is the, the rare 
and uh, scarce element we have. And so everybody will do whatever to try to save some of their time. So laziness, vanity are super important elements. And, and by making sure that those are well considered into your product, is a great thing. And I just mentioned it too, this too. Uh, there is a, a smart product manager, Scott Belsky, from Adobe, um, that says the vanity, laziness, and ego are the drivers of great products. I think that there is a few more, but I, I totally agree with Scott that these are the most fundamental that may drive your product. So start with pain, add some vision, don't forget emotions and because those are more and more part of the most successful products. So once you have done that, you basically have a, already a list of things, actions you can do. Now the problem is that how do we decide where we start? So we have some perceived pain, we have that and we have a couple of them. And in order to, to solve that perceived pain, we may, maybe need to build um, an app, a landing page, uh, write some content. So there's multiple things you need to do to achieve the goal. So many startups get lost in this process. And because they start doing what they think is important and that what please them, rather than doing things in order. It's super important to make sure that you deliver a first release of the product that contains the validation of your hypothesis and in the shortest amount of time. The easiest way to do that is building what I call a priority matrix. It's a very, very simple spreadsheet where for each line you have the activities you need to do, the description, and the second column you have the cost of that activity. The cost can be the man days that you need to build it or the actual cost if you have other ways of, of, of measuring that. The only important thing in cost is that it's proportional. So it doesn't need to be the accurate amount of money that you really need to build feature A. What is important is that if you have two things you need to build, the ratio between them is correct. So if one activity will take you the double of the effort of the other one, the number you write there should be the double. So don't try to focus on, on estimating the, the cost. Make sure that the ratio between the, the activities are correct. The other thing also is that I strongly recommend that this estimation is done in the group by the developers, not the users, not the product managers. The actual people that will have to do that. They have better information than anyone else to try to estimate that. And some people may say, you know, but my engineers try to overestimate the effort in doing something. That's not a problem because as I said before, what is important is the ratio between the things. The only things where you need to be worried is when you feel that you have two activities and your team, the engineering team, the developers are able to solve one and they don't know how to do the second one and for that reason they overestimate, then it probably means that you need to build different people on board in the process. And this is as hard as it sounds. Probably the person that you have on the table are not the right person to build what you're building. So. Second column, as I said, is the cost. Third column is the impact. How important that feature is for the user. So it's not about the product manager again. The engineers are out of the room at this point. The user alone is estimating the importance of any feature. And a good thing is also not showing the cost of something because they may be influenced by the cost and looking at something that costs high in their brain, they may think is also more valuable for them. So try to ask to the users what is important, and again, give them evaluation. And, and again, the, the ratio is important, not the number itself. 
So to repeat, you have the task in the first column, you have the cost decided by the developers in the second column, and then you have in the third column the impact, how important it is the feature, only decided by the users. Then you do a simple division. You take the impact and you divide by cost. You put this in the last column and you rank by that. It will basically give you what is the most impactful thing you can do by money. So will help you maximizing the amount of value you can create given the money. And so what you need to do now is to draw an horizontal line as soon as the, the, a valuable, a minimal valuable product is ready. So some people will go and, and try to make a product as big as possible with 20, 30 lines of activities because they fear of discovering that what they're doing is wrong. Try to avoid that by picking the smallest amount of lines possible, maybe just one, may not give you something that you can actually test with the user, with the final test that is, do you want to buy this? So it's not about you like it or not. So if you take a single line, maybe this is not enough for them to take the decision of buying or not. So you have to find the right compromise here very typically, you will be pushed by adding as many lines as you want because you don't want to discover that your product is not great. So I strongly suggest you to go against your, your natural push and find less line than possible. Probably one is not enough. A couple lines will make a nice uh, MVP. So once you've done that, you build that release you go out to users and you ask them if they want to buy it. You simulate the existence of the full product. You show them those basic features that you have built and ask them to join if it's a free product or buy. And that's the ultimate and only way to test the validity of the product. Uh, by asking if they like it, again, Will only, they will only try to please you. Based on the kind of users you get, you may have uh, super supportive responses, or if you go on Twitter, probably they will hate you and, and destroy something that has a potential. So don't listen to what people say, just look at what they do. Build something super minimal, and then ask them to buy. So if you want to build a great product, you will need creativity, discipline, with this methodology, I try to equilibrate those. Again, it's a methodology that cannot be applied to every product. It's just a simple way for which a small team of founders with maybe building their first product can go through. And I hope that on top of these, you can build your own methodology to building something great. And again, other than dis discipline and creativity, you will also need a lot of patience, a lot of hard, hard work, and a good amount of luck to create something great. So what I can tell you is good luck. So I think that now we can go with uh, some question if, um, if we have it. There is a delay of about four or five seconds from when I received the questions and I can answer. So be patient a little bit. We will look stupid a little bit, but at the end we, we will answer. So Luca, ask a DNA. How to tell if I'm going to loop where I fear I don't have enough information or if the data I have are not sufficient? Um, yeah, it's very, very similar to the problem of, of waiting, waiting until you ship the product. And the best way to solve that, again, is go out, ship the product before, when it seems too early. So try to fight 
your feeling of want to be perfect, ship always earlier than what you feel is right. And with this, you will get feedback from users and, and you will automatically find uh, a method for your work that will make you feel much, much better and unsafe because the users will help you drive the direction. The important, don't ask for opinions to users, only ask to buy. Does it work the same way for services as well? Is an insurance, the product exists? Well, sure, services, product, I think they all work in the same way. I don't think you can design a service with, with the same principle. And, uh, um, and insurance is actually, to me, even more like a product than a service. So I think definitely you can do it. the best way to attract luck. Mm. I would like to have a, 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 a just one session about luck. It's, it's a beautiful element. Um, um, so, but I, I will try to be short and say, so what people perceive as luck is not really luck, is the fact that you have success. What they don't know, and in, in, in statistics, uh, um, no, probability is the successful cases divided by the total cases. So I think that we all have the same possibilities. So at the end, we're not very different. So let's say that we have one chance out of 100 times. Okay, now, what people perceive as luck is if you win. So you cannot really influence the probability, but you can influence the amount of attempts. So if someone is testing and is doing 100 attempts, at the end, it will look like someone that did it, while all the other only did zero because they had one probability out of 100. So the best way to influence luck is while everybody is doing other things, you try multiple things many, many things, order of magnitudes, more things than the other tried, cycles, hypotheses, continuously. And if you do that, the other will not perceive the big effort that you have done, they will just perceive that you are a lucky person. And that also a good feeling. Would you, have, would you have one or more example spreadsheet that you can share? Um, yes, this is very simple. Go on marcotrombetti.com slash make and you will find uh, an essay about this. Uh, and in that essay, you will also find the spreadsheet um, uh, information. Oh, he said, um, we, disc we talked about human-centered design, and then I didn't mention the designer. Well, I, I feel myself a designer. Elon Musk defined himself as a designer. I think that the product manager I was mentioning in the discussion is exactly the designer. And, uh, but with this methodology, what I also am trying to fight is what I call uh, the creation ego of the designer. So designers are the people that make things happen, that they will help the process happening, but very often 
uh, creation ego will make you fail. Creation ego is when I feel in love of building something and I try now to make sure that everybody agree that that is what I want to do. And unfortunately in life, you will have many people around you that will please you. They will try to please you and say, yes, this is great. And you will go in the wrong direction. So the method is describe it just to avoid creation ego. And yes, the designer is the super important part and he's the product manager in the example I mentioned. I love focus group to simulate discussion and feedback. Yeah, so it's about focus group. Um, I didn't mention explicitly focus group here because I think it's something you can do in a later stage. Um, uh, what we are trying to do here is the fastest possible way to go from having an idea and building an MVP of that idea. Um, with focus group, you can fine tune an idea to the minor details to make it perfect. But um, maybe a focus group in this phase uh, may slow you down if you don't pick the super right people. And unfortunately, so, and it's part of your question, which is a very good question, this is super hard to identify the, the, the best users at the very early phase. So it's already hard to find a few, so finding many that are relevant is very hard. So with, with many, you will become with a big average. Rather than concentrating on some people you really know that are your target. So in the first phase, I, I, I really don't recommend the focus group but I recommend it immediately after, after you converge and people want what you're building and you can improve it. You also, at that point, you would know better who your users are and so it would be, user, it would be easier to answer your questions. So, what are the best users? Do you have any resource about Pathos? How should it expand it in the early product and communication? Um, no, I don't have any more uh, documentation or essays that I can share with you, but I recommend you to read about uh, Scott Belsky. Um, he's, he's working on these topics and um, he has a lot of great insights. So um, he was the founder of Beyonds, uh, the credit marketplace that was acquired by Adobe and today I, um, is probably the head of product management at Adobe. So it's Mark I follow him, uh, he's often talking about this. Uh, so I have a landing page and I didn't specify the price on the landing page. Uh, well, so if you want really to validate your idea, you need to put a price there. You need to put the full offering. Think about you're going to the market and you find on the table two apples. And one it looks a little better than the other. Okay? And, but just a little bit. Just a little bit. So if I don't put the price there, you will definitely pick the one that seems a little, little better. But then if you discover that the one apple costs one million dollar and the other one costs one euro, at the end the one euro apple will be the one that better satisfy your need. And nobody will buy the one million dollar apple. So I did an extreme case, but just to show that price is a fundamental element of the full product. And obviously better is the product, higher would be the price tag you can attach it to it and the premium value for the premium value you deliver. But it's I strongly recommend to add the full element of price and even including when they get the product. 
It's not, it's not obvious. Even when the price is even set, well, if I buy this, when do I get it? Do I get it now? Do I get it in, in one day or 90 days? Those are all important elements uh, of the offer. So make sure you really have, are putting all the information required for the person to decide to buy or not. And that's the really final proof of that what you're doing is what people love. Okay, tell him to ship even before he feels the ride, okay. Oh, yeah, so that's another fear about bad reputation and I would like to say a few words about it. So don't worry, don't fear about it. It's not gonna be a problem at all. Always ship before you feel it's right. And, um, and uh, the reason is simple. If you look at the most successful startups that are ever founded in the last, let's say, in the last 10, 20 years, can you recall one that was successful after a big launch? There is none. All of these startups grew slowly by having multiple, multiple daily launches of incremental value for the users. Um, the idea of working hard and then going out and launch something is something that is completely different from what makes a startup successful. I also understand why many people think this is the right way to do it because they try to simulate very large companies, monopolies. If you look at Apple, for example, they will be secret and one day launch a product. But managing a monopoly is very, very different than creating a new company. So don't look at what Apple does. Look at what Apple did in the early, early days. So they were assembling an hardware and selling the first thing they could and then optimizing over it. Those cycles are the most important part. And don't worry because if there is 7 billion people out there, if you go out without a lunch and talking to user one by one, you will never end by making 7 billion people unsatisfied. You will at, at maximum make a few users, tens of users unsatisfied. You still have the other 6 billion 99999. So the right way to go is ship before it feels good, talk to user, never do big lunches, incrementally, very fast, converge to what people love. What's more important, implementing unique features, more cost and time, or implementing the minimal required features to get the first version, as I said, Focus on what is important, ship as early as you can. So minimal viable product and, and start from that. Um, you will be impressed by uh, the amount of support you can receive by early users if you don't, to, if you don't pretend having something big and launch it. If you start small, um, and, and the user understand it, they will be supportive of what you do and, and, and those early users will, will build a religion almost around your product because they will feel part of it. So think about the users more like your partners that you're building the product with rather than just the, the, the customers you want to you want to get. I don't know, I think we can take another question if there is one, otherwise we go. So what about the case of a market with users that are difficult to reach? What would you do if you were building a product for a small and difficult to reach niche? Okay, first, 
that is the ideal case. It's not a bad position. I mean, you always want to start with a niche of users. You want to build something super vertical that deeply satisfied a small amount of users. And then, you know, you conquer the market by expanding it. So that's the, the way to start. And um, I, I think I have done in, in, in another video, Now to Pitch, I explained the story of Boom. Boom Supersonic is our investment that is building the new Concorde. And so they, they have a niche. They have only airlines that can buy the planes. So they started with the design and they went to visit the airlines. So the MVP is not a small plane was just a design, a rendering of what the plane would look like and all the specs and the price and the delivery terms. So they simulated the existence of a product and they collected a letter of intents. So that was a deep simulation. So they couldn't get orders at day one, but they get letter of intents. Actually, they got $5 billion of letter of intents. And only after six months or a year, some of those letter of intents became orders. And the plane is not there yet. So boom, by the way, we'll launch, uh, we show the prototype plane uh, the 7th of October this year. So make sure you don't miss that. It will be a, a giant step forward for flights. Finally, we're supersonic, uh, we'll be back. I think we're done. Oh, there is one more. Okay. So in this book, Fishkin tells that you need to build the exceptional viable product better than the MVP. What do you think about it? Oh, if you can build an exceptional viable product, it is definitely better than a minimal viable product. But it's still a super, super small amount of features that are attacking the, um, uh, the perceived pain of the user. So, and uh, on my opinion, so what exceptional is, is not really on the features of the product, it's much more in the relationship that you build with the user. The amazing customer support the amazing general support that you give to the user to try to achieve their goals. They come to you because they want to solve something and it's not about the product only, it's the experience, the amount of help you give them by solving the problem. And sometimes an early problem, this may look even almost like a one-to-one -one consultancy. But if you do it, these are the very early days, you will learn a lot and convert the consultancy service experience into a product, and then you can build great things. So, so there's one more, sorry. So, as I see if I understand, yes. So it's coming one more, okay. Finding the relevant user to iterate with a, is a painful process. How do you make sure you engage with the most relevant users to get the most valuable feedback. Uh, yeah, I don't have an easy methodology for finding the best users there. And it's, I agree, it's painful. So what I've noticed sometimes that you, know, you, you start to what you feel is the user because you had an idea and you had a target market, and so you felt that that person was the real solution. Then when you, when you, when you talk uh, with the person, you realize that it's not really an early adopter, it's not someone willing to pay a premium for solving the problem. This is the case where you want to change the users. Uh, you don't want also to, uh, to change users um, to feel good. Sometimes, you know, you, in your mind, you want to solve, you, you have an idea, you want to prove that idea is right, and then you say, is the user the problem, is, 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 is not the idea. 
So you have to balance these two things, and it's, it's, it's complex. And I think that if you know what you're balancing, at least you know um, how to behave. So thank you so much. Uh, I think we're done for today. And um, uh, you can find, um, so this video was as part of some videos I'm making on, on why and how to start up. And they are all inspired by some essay I wrote that you can find for free on marcotrombetti.com. And you can also find the book on, on Amazon. And if you buy there, all the profits will go to um, UNICEF. So in marcotrombetti.com, you will find it for free. And we just released also a podcast uh, for it. So I will make other videos talking about the why and how to build great startups. Thank you so much. See you next time.